Well, good morning, Fairdale. Hope that you all are doing well this morning. Hopefully you've had a, a good morning and you've got your Bible, you've got your family gathered around, and you are ready to open the Word, to hear from it, to sing along with the band, and to enjoy Sunday morning as best as we can while we're not able to be together. I do have a couple announcements for you this morning. Uh, before I get to those, I want to encourage you to open in your Bibles to our call to worship, which is Psalm 119. We are almost done with this psalm. We will look at verses 161 down through the end, uh, through 168. And as you're turning there, um, this is the week after Easter. Last week was a great service. I hope that you all had some good time with your family, celebrating the resurrected King. And as I was reading the book of Acts this week, I came upon a verse in Acts chapter 25 that was talking about the Jews being at odds with Paul. And it, and it really came down to this thing. And it said that they were disputing about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. And that should be us as Christians each and every week, not only on Easter, but every single day of the year. We should be asserting that Jesus is alive. He is resurrected from the grave. And we praise God for that. A couple announcements for you all. Uh, we have been doing Wednesday nights live on Avaya Spaces. That has been going great. For those of you who have participated, uh, I think you would agree that it's been a good time. We've enjoyed seeing each other, hearing from each other, and that's been a good time. This week, we are also going to add a Tuesday evening study for ladies. Uh, I don't know exactly what time that will be, but be looking at your emails and social media, and we will announce that. But also, we're going to start back with the Thursday morning Bible study. Uh, this will be at its typical time, 10 a.m., and that's going to be live through the Avaya Spaces as well. So you can access that the same place where you go to access Wednesday nights. So we are trying as best as we can to offer these things for you all. We want you all to be plugged in. We want you all to be in the Word. We want you all to be growing during this strange time. But let's look now at our call to worship, Psalm 119. And we'll begin in verse 161. It says, Princes persecute me without cause. But my heart stands in awe of your words. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. God, we are thankful that while we're not able to be together, we are able to do this. That technology has gotten us to a place where we don't have to go months without even seeing or hearing from one another, but we're able to, to do this virtually. And God, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that Jesus, your son, died for us, but more so than just died, that he rose from the dead and that he is alive forevermore. And as the book of Acts said, that Paul asserted that he was alive. May we do the same. In all the conversations that we have with all the people that we know, may we be asserting that Jesus is alive. And that's why we're here. And that is why we are worshiping this morning. That's why we're sitting around our TVs at 1045 on a Sunday morning watching a worship service. Because Jesus is alive. God, we thank you for your testimonies. All of Psalm 119 has, has laid claim to the fact that your testimonies are perfect. That they are instructing us. They are uh, shaping us and molding us and changing us into the image of your son. And God, that's what we need. And so we ask this morning that as we are about to sing and as we hear from your word, as Josh preaches here in just a little bit, that we would be built up and encouraged as the body of Christ, even though we are not able to be together in this room. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome. For those of you tuning in online, uh, would, you, would you sing together with us?
Our New Testament scripture reading this morning will be from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 33. Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is it life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread, yet I tell you, that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we love you, Lord. Lord, when we read scripture like this, when we see you encouraging us through the words of Matthew here to to not worry and not be so concerned with the things of this world, the things that are temporary, Lord. We know we desperately need this word in this time. When many are worrying about things, Lord, like what they will eat, what they will wear, what's going on with the virus, what's going on with the economy, what's going on with so many things, so many unknowns, so many things for us to worry about, Lord. We need to hear this message, not to worry, but to trust in you. Lord, and as we, as we seek to do that, we still know that you care for us. We know that you care about those needs in our lives, Lord. And, and we see that you will provide. Lord, and we know that in that provision, it's not always in the way that we expect. It's not always in the way that we perhaps desire, Lord, but we know that you care for us, that you love us, and that you have promised to provide for us. And we thank you for that, Lord. Lord, we pray now as we prepare to continue in worship that you would prepare our hearts, Lord. Prepare us for this message. Encourage us, Lord. Give us strength. Give us an excitement for your word, Lord, an excitement for what you're doing even amongst us in this difficult time. Lord, we know that you're at work and we trust you and we praise you, Lord, for all that you are doing. We pray that you would help us to trust you more, that you would help us, Lord, to seek to to do your will and to seek to, to lift each other up in this time and point each other to you and to your word. We ask and pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to continue in worship. Praise the Lord, my hope is found. That he is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of
of the world by darkness came, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my death. All right, we're going to go ahead and go into our time of pastoral prayer. If you would, join me as we go to the Lord. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning to worship you, to focus upon you. We come here, God, after a, a long and hard week, a heavy week, a lonely week. And we're, we're ready for this, God. We're wanting this. We've had so much downtime, God, that we didn't want to wait all the way till Sunday morning for this. We need to focus on you. God, we need to be reminded that you are a Father in heaven and that you love us and that you are here for us and that we are yours. And that we don't come into being yours by earning it or qualifying or being good enough or performing, but we are accepted by your Son through Jesus. By grace, God, we are yours. And we need to focus on that. And Father, here we are in the middle of a stay-at-home time, and we are aware that stress, burden, worry, anxiety continues to spread. It's increasing. We have people that are struggling, hurting, dealing with these things. Father, we want to pray that you would help. Father, we turn to you in the midst of our worries, in the midst of our cares, our concerns, our burdens, our anxieties. We cast those upon you. We are reminded, God, that the Proverbs say that our anxieties weigh us down. So, Father, we come here this morning praying for those who have been at home all week thinking about how tight money is, thinking about those who don't know if they will continue to have a job. We pray for those who are sick and are worried about their health or those who are worried about getting sick, God. We pray for those who have been at home all week with children and now they are just worn out. They are exhausted. They are mentally exhausted, God, we pray for those people who are thinking that life seems to be so not right or good or fair that I'm not sure if I want to keep holding on to God and his truth and his son, Jesus. God, we pray for people that in their struggle, they would turn to you. God, we pray this morning as what we're doing that we would trust Christ, that we would point people to trust Christ, that he is a true savior that he gave his life for us, that he accepts us as we turn to him. Father, I pray that we would not be a stressed out people, 
that we would not be an overwhelmed, frustrated, grumpy, difficult people. But Father, that we would be loved by you. And in being so loved by you, Father, that it would flow back out of, flow back out of us. That we would truly treat people the way that you are treating us. That we would treat people the way we would want them to treat us. Father, that we would be kind and gracious as we know you to be kind and gracious to us. That we would be patient as we know you to be patient with us. Father, that's our prayer here. That's the prayer of the pastors of this church that the church would love each other, look to your word, believe you, trust you, and that you would give us peace. Peace in the midst of this time that is uh, uneasy. Father, we look to you now. and We pray that you would bless the preaching of the word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would, turn in the Bible to Philippians chapter four. Philippians chapter four. We took a break last week from this because it was Easter Sunday But we're ready to get back to it, and I've got to tell you that I'm so ready for us to walk through this. I feel like the Word of God is masterfully planned uh, for us, and even the scheduling that we try to do of preaching the Word of God, even when we don't have a clue, is masterfully planned by God, truly ordained by Him. We are in the middle of what some are calling the worst situation that our country's ever been in, predicting that it's going to get worse, and yet we find ourselves at the perfect and ideal passage in the Word of God. I often like to tell our church that sometimes it doesn't even need to be preached. We just need to read it. We need to give some time to allow our minds to get to it and rest on it. This morning's passage from Philippians chapter four, we're gonna read verses four through seven. This morning's passage from Philippians chapter four is about worry and anxiety. It's about worry, anxiety, and peace. I would have thought before we got to this passage that those were subjects that didn't need to be addressed to the Philippian church. He loves them. He's bragging on them. It seems that he thinks really well of the Philippian church. This passage, this this little book is full of so many positives, so much good stuff that you would think that, hey, maybe they don't struggle. Or maybe they don't struggle with anxiety and worry. But here we find ourselves at the end of the book, the final chapter, the final paragraphs And he tells them to not be anxious, to not worry. Seems like, listen, that in April of 2020, telling somebody to not worry is not sensitive. It's insensitive. That there is so much anxiety today that we need to be more understanding more gracious and kind in it than we need to be telling people to not be. And yet, this morning, we're going to see that God says to us to not be. Let me first say here at the very beginning that I know that worry, anxiety, even depression, stress are real issues. They are real issues that you have in your lives. They are real issues that I have in my life, my family has in our lives. We struggle with these things. And I don't want here uh, today to even sound like there is um, a a lack of sensitivity to that. This is a real issue. I also want to remind you all that everybody is in a different position. Everybody's story is a little bit different. You don't know where we've been. You don't know what we're going through right now. And so for us to be judgmental towards somebody who is worrying or anxious uh, can be wrong. We need to be mindful of that. This, This month has been more challenging on my family than normal months. And yet, it's 
really been kind of neat for me and my wife to be at home more together with our children. The weather has been fantastic for the most part. We've been outside, we've been playing, we've done yard work, we've played ball, we've been on walks, we've been on bike rides, we've done all of that, and yet it's been hard. The kids are trying to do online school and teach themselves online school. They can chat with their teachers. That's a hard thing. And it's added a little bit of stress to my family. And yet I think about people who perhaps don't have the internet. Or I think about people who don't have a parent or a mom or a dad and not able to help. I know that my wife, Val, the kid's mom, has been spending, honestly, hours and hours and hours trying to help five different kids do all of their schoolwork uh, during the day. It's a lot. She has told me at times, it's been a long day. So we need to understand that there are people who are going through it, but there are people in much, much, much worse positions than us, and we need to be kind and understanding to that. With all of that said, Read with me from Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a passage. You know, when you get here, it's hard to break it up. Some people preach verses four and five by themselves. Some people go six and seven by themselves. Some people go four through seven. Some people go all the way into eight and nine. But I I didn't want to get ahead of this. And next week, we're going to look at verses eight and nine. But today, we're looking at verses four through seven, and we're gonna call this worry, anxiety, and peace. Anxiety is an emotion produced by fear, but it's an emotion, listen, produced by a future fear. It is people thinking into the future about things they don't know or they don't understand. It's the unknown, it's the uncertain, it's the this could happen, it's the potential of what could be that now begins to make us anxious and we deal with anxiety and for some people this is very real in his book running scared ed welch says worriers are visionaries minus the optimism worriers are visionaries minus the optimism they are thinking about all the things that could be happening or that are going to happen but none of them are spun into a good way this could happen and it'd be a good thing And so what happens is the negative thoughts or possibilities or the potential that could happen is what comes out and it begins to make us scared, makes us fearful or afraid, and we get anxious. The Bible is speaking to this here. The Apostle Paul is speaking to this here, which lets us know that worry and anxiety is not necessarily something new or stress or suffering or the, uh, or the disease of it is not something new. We have him speaking to it here in chapter four. Today I want to give you three points, very simple. Rejoice, run, and rest. Rejoice, run, and rest. Let's begin with number one, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord. The Apostle Paul says it very clear in verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He wants the Philippians to be a rejoicing people. But remember, this is now the conclusion of the book. And so what is really important is for you to remember what we saw two weeks ago on Palm Sunday from verse one, where he says, therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. He is calling this church to stand firm. He's calling the believers to stand firm. And so what he does as they are planting and rooting themselves and getting positioned to to stand firm, not be shaken, not be knocked over, not fall into sin or fall away from grace, like to, to, to stand firm is what he's telling them to do. And then what we have going now through these next several verses are pictures or imperatives Uh, of what it looks like standing firm. And what we have here today is to rejoice. Christians are to be people that rejoice. They're to be people who find positives, find good. They're to be people who look for good things. They're to be people who find joy and find happiness in things. We are to be rejoicing in the Lord always. He says it right there. In one verse, he says rejoice twice. 
This is a theme that the Apostle Paul has, and we see this. Again, it's a small book, as I've said many times, chap- four chapters, 121 verses. And yet he says rejoice many times. Uh, chapter 1, verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Chapter 2, verse 17. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Chapter 2, verse 18. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Chapter 2, verse 28. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. Paul there mentions his Anxiety. Chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord. Like we've already seen, looking ahead to verse 10 of chapter 4, I rejoiced in the Lord. He often uses the word rejoice. We're to be a rejoicing people. But there's another phrase in Philippians that brings the rejoicing into perspective a little bit better, and it's this phrase, in the Lord. And if he uses the word rejoicing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, he uses the phrase, in the Lord, even more often, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times we have the phrase, in the Lord. So let's look at that. Chapter 1, verse 14, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord, confidence in the Lord, chapter 2, verse 19, I hope in the Lord. Hope from the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 24. And I trust in the Lord that, I short, that shortly I myself will come also. He's trusting in the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 29. So receive him in the Lord. Have a visitor come to you as you receive them in the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 1. Stand firm in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 10, again, rejoice in the Lord. And so what you see here is there are two really, really common expressions in this letter to the church, rejoicing and in the Lord. There's perspective here. The ability or this ability to rejoice is from being in the Lord. Look at how often he says this, even in this letter. Rejoice in the Lord. Hear the words here of John MacArthur when he speaks about rejoicing in the Lord. He says, signifies, this rejoicing in the Lord signifies the sphere in which the believer's joy exists. Where does the ability to rejoice in the Lord come from? It's a sphere unrelated to the circumstances of life. And so you can see how this is going to quickly get into worry and anxiety. It's a sphere unrelated to the circumstances of life, but it's related to an unassailable, unchanging relationship to the sovereign Lord. We are to be people who understand that God is with us, that we are with God, that he is a father in heaven to us. We are to be people who are believing that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives, that he knows what's going on with us, that he walks with us. He is a shepherd that leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. There is nowhere that we can go that he's not going before us, right? He walks with us and he talks with us. We are in his hands and nothing can snatch us out of his hand. We are to understand that we walk by faith, not by sight. And so in every situation, we can rejoice in the Lord. We can see things like, man, this is awful that we are in a quarantine and we are stuck at home. Or we can look and say, hey, I don't know what God's doing, but I'm going to trust him with it. He's got good reason why he's doing what he's doing. He's got me stuck at home. Maybe it's more time for my wife. Maybe it's more time for my kids. Maybe it's more time for me to slow down. We have to be people who are able to walk believing that God is in charge, knows what he's doing, and so we are able to rejoice in the Lord. He even says it twice, rejoice in the Lord, and again I will say rejoice. But then he follows it up with this statement. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. This immediately is a huge challenge on whether you really rejoice in the Lord. See, a quick glance at 4-4, rejoice in the Lord, tries to make us into this like a happy person that just walks around always smiling. But rejoicing in the Lord is so much more than that. It is other than that. Rejoicing in the Lord brings into perspective that we are children of God. Living in light of who he is and his truths, living our lives in this challenging, fallen world where we know that life is hard, 
where we know that sin is real, where we know that struggle is such a real thing. And so he says here, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. As you believe in the Lord and rejoice in him, let it be that everybody is able to see how reasonable you are. Let your relationship with God, your joy in him, be seen by everybody. This word reasonableness here, in my, in my translation, it's reasonableness. In other translations, it's, it's gentleness. And so I want to be able to speak to both of those. Reasonableness and gentleness, the same word that means both of those. Reasonable and gentle, right? So you get this idea of where we're at, right? Life is hard. There are some people right now that are so stressed out that if one more thing goes wrong, they're going to lose it. I'm one step away, one day away, one more bad thing away from just giving up, throwing it all in. We know people are that way. There are some people right now that if you cross them one more time, they're ready to bust you. They're ready to explode on you, right? They're going to give you an earful, right? We know people that are that way. And yet, living in that world, because that's reality, we who know the Lord and rejoice in him, should be reasonable. We should be gentle. He then says, the Lord is at hand. Another translation says, the Lord is near. This means either near in time or near in space, meaning he's about to come back or he's around us. I think here, speaking to space, not time. I think it means space. The Lord is near. The Lord is right here. In whatever situation you're in, with anxiety and worry, he's there. You're never going, where is God? Or if you are saying, where is God, you're, you're questioning him, but you need to know that he is there and he sees. So it's a, it's, it's a space thing, not a time thing. But listen to this. He sees this. He knows what we are going through, even right now. Picture this. This is what Job didn't know. You know the book of Job and you know the story. We talk about it a lot. You and I know that Job's life and situation, which was very uh, anxious creating, right? Job was struggling. We've got all of those chapters about it. But we know, listen, that Job's situation was because of the design. It was because of the masterful design that God did. We know that because of the way that God wrote the book of Job for us. The reader knows the setting. The reader knows the context of Job's life. Job doesn't. When you read the book of Job, this horrible story of what's happening to Job, you don't think it horrible. Because the good God, his Father in heaven, that loves him and will never leave him or forsake him, is there. He's the one letting it happen. He's the one planning it to happen. He's the one wanting it to happen, God is. But you know that when you read it. But Job doesn't. We know that Job should not worry, don't we? You know that Job should not be stressed out. But all of his children had died. All of his money, his security was gone. All of his identity was gone. And yet we think, oh, he shouldn't worry. He's good. God's got him. We know that he shouldn't worry. We know that Job should not be anxious about what is happening to him. We know that his father in heaven knows what he needs. And yet, even as I've described that now, it is hard to say, Job, just chill out. Job, it's all good. Why are you even acting like that? Why are you doubting? Why are you struggling? Because it is hard. But God gave us Job so that you and I, in every single struggle, would believe he's right there behind us, toying with the devil to prove how glorious he is that we would trust him. That's what Job's about. Job never let go. God never let go of Job. Job never let go of God. It's an awesome story about how good God is to his people. And Satan looks like a joke in it. He's doing everything he can, but he cannot get it, God. And he really cannot get it, Job, if what's most important, it was never lost. And so we know to not worry. But God gave that to us so that we would be there. So that we can be reasonable with people. So that we can say, man, they're probably going through stuff. We would be mindful of that. So that we would realize, I'm going through stuff, but God knows. So we wouldn't freak out. We wouldn't say, God hates me. God doesn't care. Where is he at? Nobody knows what I'm going through. I've got it the worst of all. Pity party. That we wouldn't do that. That we would be reasonable. That's what Paul tells the church to be, reasonable. But the word also means gentle, and even some translations use that, so let's talk about that. Gentleness means, listen, 
Not insisting on every right of letter of law or custom. It means yielding. It means gentle. It means kind. It means courteous. It means tolerant. Such a leniency, commentator writes, Hansen, such leniency needs to be evident in the lives of Christians as opposed to the non-recipients of grace, listen to this, who can still be stiff and bristly. Imagine if people who are in the Father's hand, loved with an everlasting love, are known as being rough and bristly and stiff and not understanding. The pastoral books, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, include gentleness, listen to this, as an essential qualification for leadership in the church, 1 Timothy 3, 2. And they call for members of the church to be gentle to everyone, Titus 3, 3. Gentleness is a characteristic of Christians because our entire experience of life is in the loving hands of God. We should be reasonable. We should be gentle. We should have a graciousness with humility about us. In verse four, the apostle Paul tells the church to rejoice in the Lord always. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The faith you have, the faith you believe, let it be obvious that your life, the way you live, the way you act, the way you react, the way you're proactive, the way you're reactive, the way you plan, the way you strategize, the way you handle difficulty, no matter what you deal with, let it be known that God's got you, that you believe him, and your joy is not in circumstances. As I opened with, these past weeks have been tough. And this week, I thought I couldn't take it any more. I was home, trying to work from home a little bit, trying to be nice and help with schoolwork, and it just was overwhelming me. I felt like this is hard, and I need to step aside, that this is a lot to handle. And my wife, in an awesome, loving way that she does, says, be reasonable, Josh. This is what us moms do all the time with kids. Yes, it's hard. This is our lives. All of the kids talking at once, all of them asking for help at once. I mean, seriously, if I had a dollar for every time I heard a kid this week say, Mama, just this week, I think I could pay back the entire U.S. stimulus, stimulus package. It's unbelievable how many times I've heard, Mama, 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 nonstop. And when I start thinking about only Josh, I would say things like, this is ridiculous. Y'all need to calm down. You're acting crazy. Without thinking of anybody else's situation, without turning my faith toward God, I'm being unreasonable. And the Bible here in Philippians 4 says that Christians are to be reasonable because our joy or our rejoicing is in the Lord. Well, that says a lot. And from there, he says that the Lord is at hand. God is here he is involved with our lives. We are not living our lives, and when we need him, we call God in. We are not living as uh, isolated people who believe in God, but he's not with us. No, he is with us always. And so, the Apostle Paul here runs to what is the very, very most important part of the passage, where he runs now to my second point, to prayer. Number one, rejoice in the Lord. Number two, run to God in prayer. Look at verse five. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Verse six, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Here's where he says, do not be anxious in anything. Yes, the Bible Yes, the word of God says, do not be anxious. And not only does it say, do not be anxious, it says, do not be anxious in anything. And the very next words are, but in everything, pray. Pray, pray, pray. God has an answer to our anxiety and our worry, and it is to pray. In this verse, we have now, listen, three different words for prayer. 
You have prayer, you have supplication, and you have let your requests be made known to God. Prayer, supplication, and requests. And the prayers are to be with thanksgiving, and this goes right hand in hand with verse four that said, rejoice in the Lord. If everything in our life and all of our experiences are supposed to be met with rejoicing, then all of our experiencing and our rejoicing is supposed to be met with thanksgiving. We are to be thankful for God that he has brought us into whatever situation he has brought us to. Well, when you start to think about Thanksgiving, here's what we mean. We mean gratitude. Gratitude to God. Grateful to God. We could say, hey, I could have it better. We could say, hey, I could have it worse. Could be worse. Beyond that, it is a God who is the most important thing to me, my rock and my salvation, the foundation literally that I've built my life upon, the the, the very salvation that I have for all of the sin that's in my life, the forgiveness that, that, that I have through Christ, my life is built on God, and he, God, my Father, has me here, has me in this situation, and for that I should be thankful. One commentator, Hansen, says, only by praying with thanksgiving in every situation is it possible to stop being anxious about anything. I said earlier that anxiety and worry is a fear on future things. If fear focuses on something we are afraid of losing in the future, gratitude is focusing on all that God is doing for us right now. Can we hear that? If fear is focusing on something we are afraid of losing in the future, Gratitude is focusing on all that God is doing for us right now. And so you can see where worry, anxiety becomes so troublesome is because something that could happen later is messing up the thankfulness or the gratefulness that we should be having right now. R.C. Sproul says, presenting requests in prayer to God provides an outlet for anxiety. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. The verse before that, verse 6, is where he says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Folks, time and time again, believers and unbelievers both alike, want there to be something that we can do to make our worry and anxiety go away. Listen, there isn't. There is not an answer to that. I cannot count how many times since I've been a pastor that I've gotten a call from somebody. Most often, it's a call from a church member who has a family member that is suffering. This happens a lot. And they call me over because their family member is suffering so much with such and such an issue. We get to talking, and they end up saying, okay, well then tell me what to do and I'll do it. There's not an answer to that. The answer that Paul is telling the church to is to believe God. And in believing, run to him, run to him, run to him in prayer. Cry out in prayer. Believe him and pray. Believe him and supplicate. Believe him and make requests. Get your heart to a place where you're able to stop stressing out over it and you're able to be thankful in it. Thank you for my stresses. Thank you that these kids are driving me crazy. Thank you that we don't have any money. Thank you that even though we don't have any money, thank you that we're alive. Get ourselves to the place where we can say thank you to God as we are talking to him. This is what the Bible says. Now, I know that when people hear that, their first reaction is, yeah, right. Sounds good. Sounds good for a preacher whose life looks all nice and pretty, but it doesn't work for people who are really struggling with anxiety. I understand that. I hear that all the time, too. But I want you to know that this is the very word of God speaking to us today on what to do when we're anxious. God says, run to him in prayer. Three words in one verse about prayer. This is what he wants us to do. He says, I care for you. He says that. As my good friend and pastor Tanner Turley in Boston says, anxiety in our lives is cured by addition, not by subtraction. Because when we talk to people who are really struggling, they say things like this. Yeah, but if, if I, once I get the money, everything will be okay. 
Once this passes, I'll be all right. Once the kids go back to school, I'll be all right. Once they get out of my life, I'll be all right. Once this happens, once that happens, everything will be better. We think that some subtraction is going to help, and the Bible totally, totally disagrees. Less drama, less stuff, less circumstances, better circumstances are not what fixes or removes our anxiety. It does not remove our worry. Anxiety is not, listen, anxiety is not from what's going on outside of us. Hear me. Anxiety is not from what's going on outside of us. Anxiety is what's going on inside of us. Anxiety is what's happening inside of us in relation to the circumstances around us. And this is where God comes in. This is where prayer comes in. When something is happening on the inside, we don't feel good. One of the things with me is when I start to get worried or stressed, I start biting my fingernails. And there are times in my life, perhaps on payday, where my nails start growing out really good, right? When kids are doing well, right? I start looking down and think, man, my nails are growing. I must, life must be going okay. But then there are times in my life where I'm like nonstop like this. There are actually times where Val will look over to me and she'll say, what's going on? Why are you biting your nails so much? What are you thinking about? What are you stressed out about? And I can tell with a gauge of how often I'm doing that or just by looking down at my hands, what is stressing me out. This is not something that's happening on the outside. This is something that's happening on the inside and it is there where God comes in and it's there where prayer comes in. The Bible says to run to God in prayer. Look back at Philippians 4, verse six. Do not be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The Bible literally says that in everything we should be praying. And so now I have to go here. Now would be a good time for me to say a little bit more. We do not pray enough. We struggle with worry. We struggle with anxiety and we don't pray. Now, don't get me wrong, I know you pray. And I know you like to pray. But we have a problem. We think that worrying about something is equal to prayer. We think that thinking about something a lot is, is equal to prayer, and it's not. It is not at all. Prayer is a conversation. It is a communication. It is where you are speaking to a God who has ears, who is telling us that he hears us. And I think the reason why we don't pray, first, could be we really don't know how. There aren't enough good examples in our lives that have shown us that. We, 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 we live in Christian homes where everybody goes to church and they don't even pray for their food. They don't even thank God for their food. I can't tell you how many times I've been out to lunch with a church member that we go to church with all the time for lunch. And I say, you want to pray? And they say, no. Or they sit right down. They say, no, you go ahead. Or they sit right down and they're immediately right in eating. They don't even pray for their food. They don't even say, thank you, God, for the food. If you're not praying for the food, I know you're not praying for your kid getting bullied. I know you're not praying for your kid having anxiety itself. You're saying I'll pray for you. You're saying the right things. I'm not saying you're a bad parent. I'm saying we don't pray enough. We think we pray because we say that we pray. We intend to pray. Hey, I'll pray for you. I'm thinking about this a lot. You've been on my mind. I'm worrying about you. I've been thinking about you nonstop. I called to check on you, but we didn't pray. We didn't stop in our day, turn off the TV, sit down, not fall asleep, get on our knees, and actually say, dear God, I know you love me. I know you trust me. I know that you know that I trust you. I know Jesus died for my sins. I know that I'm forgiven. I'm coming to you now to pray for this situation. They're burdened. They're burdened, God. They're worried. Would you help them with that? Or the same thing for you. Dear God, I know you know how much I'm struggling. Help me with this that I'm worried about. We don't do that. We don't. So why don't we? And I think now's the time. When else to go here? I'm behind a camera, you're not there. You don't even have to walk out on Sunday and look me in the eye and act like you hated the sermon or act like you liked the sermon, right? You didn't know this happened. And I think the reason why we're not praying, it has something to do with our faith in God. 
Our view of God is not big. Our view of God is not big enough. We don't believe him to be the sovereign Lord who saved us. We think we got saved on our own initiative. We think that, that we did it. We think that our lives are in our control and we want God to help us. That's the honest truth. That's the way most people are living. We don't believe that God is the sovereign Lord who can remove our worry and anxiety. We don't believe that. We don't ask him to remove it because we don't think that he will, to be honest. We don't ask him to take away my worry, make me content in him. God, make this stressed out individual thankful. Give me gratitude. Make me reasonable. Make me gentle. Give me a reason to rejoice right now. And We don't think that he will answer that prayer, so we don't ask him to. And that's the truth. We don't ask him to. And if that is true, and I think it is, we've got a problem. We don't believe him to be a father in heaven that loves us so much. We don't believe him to be the one that Matt McBroom read earlier from Matthew 6 that says, the birds are taken care of and I love them more than you. The flowers are taken care of and I love, and I, sorry, the birds are taken care of and I love you more than them. The flowers are taken care of and I love you more than them. We don't, we don't believe that. We are not wrapped up in, he is with me right now. His Holy Spirit is inside of me. He knows that I'm worried and I'm anxious. He knows that I'm wrestling with it. He knows I'm afraid of something that I should not be afraid of, and he can calm down. We just don't believe that. We don't believe that if we cry out to him, he will hear our prayer and answer us. We don't believe that he means it when he says, knock, 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 come to me, keep pleading, and I will answer. We don't believe him to be the one who does that. We don't believe that. We've got a problem there. He's that big. That big. We've got to get to where we're saying the God of the Bible is true and he's real and he's here and he's with me and he's in my home. I remember as my girl, so the way it is at our house, our two girls share a room. They got a bunk bed and they're there and we almost always try to put them together at the same time. And we go through stages where, you know, one falls asleep right away, then they both stay up, one falls asleep earlier. But a while back, I remember when one of my girls, almost every night, for a few weeks, not for long, but almost every night, she would say, I know I'm going to have bad dreams. I know I'm going to have bad dreams. I'm scared. Will you pray? And it was such an awesome time, a formative time in her life as a little girl to say, listen, I wanna teach you something right now. God is real, he's your father and he knows. And we can ask him right now to help you not have bad dreams. And when we be believe in him through Jesus, he hears our prayers. Let's do that. He wants you to sleep good. He wants this night to be such a good rest for you. He wants you to get all the rest you need so your body grows and, and rejuvenates. And so when you wake up tomorrow, you're ready to go to have another day where you can go and live for him. That's what God wants. Let's pray. And we would pray. And some morning she'd say, I didn't have any bad dreams. And some morning she would say, I still had bad dreams. And then the next couple nights I'd forget to pray. And she'd say, Dad, you didn't pray for my bad dreams. But we kept praying. And do you want to know something? I can't remember the last time she said she had bad dreams. I can't. That's not an issue with our kids anymore. Now, we've got lots of other issues. But bad dreams right now with our girls is not an issue. And you know what? I know that unbelievers out there will laugh at this. But it's because we prayed to God about it. It is. He's a father who tells us to do this. Our worry and anxiety was taken away there. Now, I've got a whole lot of other worry and anxiety. I still bite my nails. I haven't prayed about those things. I've got a lot of room to grow. But there are examples where we run to God in prayer, and he hears them and he answers them. Listen to me. No matter who you are, whether you've ever prayed before, the answer to your worry and anxiety. Now, it's not all going to go away necessarily. The answer is to believe him and run to God and pray. Turn the TV off. Slow down down, get alone, say no to the next time somebody asks you to do something. Find some time to pray to God. And if you don't know how, we want to help you. I would love to help you. My career allows me to go and pray with anybody. We want to do that. Run to God in prayer. When the coronavirus really got going and we all got shut down, everybody had to stay at home, the Catholic church got put in a neat spot 
because the Catholic Church believes that you have to go and talk to a priest to confess your sins. They weren't allowed to do that. Right now, currently in Kentucky, they're still not allowed to do that. So the Pope, the Pope said this. If you cannot find a priest to confess to, speak directly with God, your Father. Tell God the truth. Say, Lord, I did this, this, this. Forgive me, God, and ask for pardon with all your heart. When people asked about that and kind of wanted him to qualify it, he said this. As the Catholic Church Catechism teaches, you can draw near to God's forgiveness without having a priest at hand. Think about it. This is the moment. You know what, folks? He is right. You know what's troubling? That he's just now saying it. Listen to me. When God gave his son Jesus to die on the cross for us, when he died on the cross, access to God was open straight as can be. And the Bible says that we can now draw near to God's throne with boldness, with confidence. We can say, that's my God, that's my Father. Jesus died for me, my sins are forgiven. Let me talk to him. And we can, and he hears us. I hope right now that every person that attends a Catholic church is rejoicing that a step to God has been removed. I hope coronavirus, and I, and I don't mean this lightheartedly, I hope coronavirus goes on and on and on if it's causing people to turn to God instead of a priest. Because Jesus is the priest that takes you straight to God. You can talk to him. The Bible says, with our worry and anxiety, to run to God in prayer. We are to rejoice in the Lord. We are to run to God in prayer. And then lastly, we are to rest in God's peace. Look at verse seven. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, we always have to be very careful to act like the Bible saying, if you do this, you'll get that, right? Because we know that we have a relationship with God, a sovereign God who does what he pleases. But you must admit that one of the ways that you get peace with God is by being a prayerful, a prayerful person about what makes you anxious. Don't be anxious, but pray and the peace of God will be with you. That's what Philippians 4 says. Don't be anxious, but pray, and the peace of God will be with you. It describes the peace of God. It says this. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. The peace, this literally means the peace that is above every mind. The peace that is so good, there's no explaining it really. It doesn't make sense. You, you, should, it, you shouldn't look like you have peace. You shouldn't be as calm as you are. You shouldn't have the ability to not be so stressed out. What is it about you that calms you down? It's a peace that the world is in all of. It's a peace that only God's love and truth can explain. It is this invisible strength in us. It is truly of another world. It is truly divine, and it is a real thing. It is the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. The Bible says, when we are a praying people, praying to God, by faith, he begins to give us peace. But experiencing the peace of God, listen to this, only happens when we have peace with God. Experiencing the peace of God only happens when we have peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps the reason why your worry and anxiety continues to grow is because you've not surrendered your life to Jesus. You've not found God to be the one who will forgive you of all your sins by faith. You've not heard and believed or accepted that you can't earn it. You can't prove it. You can't do enough. You can't. 
And perhaps the reason why you're so burdened or feeling the weight of the world is because you're trying so hard. Perhaps the very words, I'm about ready to give up, should be a sign to you of that. Listen, God loves you and his son died for you and he will forgive all of your sins. Believe him. Ask him to forgive you. Turn to him. Then you will have peace with God. And as you begin to believe him and have peace with him, you know he's not mad at you. He's forgiven you. Heaven is your home and you're his child. As you have that peace with God, then all your your circumstances and the way you view your circumstances will start to shift. Now, it's not going to automatically overnight be different. But the truth of God dwelling in your hearts, the peace of God dwelling in your hearts will start to shape the way you see everything. You'll begin to rejoice in the Lord always. You'll begin to give thanks in every circumstance. You'll begin to say, I need to pray about this. I need to pray about this. I need to pray about this. And you'll begin to experience the peace of God. Listen to Isaiah 26, verse 3. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. God keeps people peaceful when they are focused on God. Because they're trusting him. He does not necessarily change their circumstances. We know of a family, listen to this. We know of a family who are recently missionaries in a very, very secure country. It's dangerous there. And because of some sickness, they traveled out. And when they traveled out, they were there under quarantine. And after several weeks of that very uncomfortable spot, they were informed that they would never again be allowed to go back. All of their stuff, all of their belongings are still there. They can't go back to get it. They told them they need to get back here. Think about how terrible that is. Some of y'all lose your faith over forgetting your wallet. Some of y'all lose your Christianity and get angry over being slow in a Dairy Queen line. They are not allowed to go back home ever and get their stuff. And yet when they sent me the email, when they sent me the email that said that, that updated everybody on their email list, they said we are rejoicing with God because we know he's in control. Where does that come from? Is that real? Yes, it's real. There's a peace of God in their hearts and in their minds that says, God's got this. Why? I don't know. Way I would have done it? Not necessarily. But I can trust him. And that is a real thing. That is called the supernatural. That is the spiritual. But that's what Jesus does. And we are to be people who rest In the peace of God, the calming, protecting peace of God. Listen to these words from John 16, 33. Jesus said, I have said these things that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In that very verse in John 16, Jesus says, I'm saying this to you to give you peace because it's going to be hard. It's going to be ugly. There's going to be worry and there's going to be anxiety. There's going to be but I want you to have peace in it. He doesn't remove the storm. He gives you peace in the storm. He doesn't remove the affliction necessarily. He gives you peace that surpasses all understanding in it, and we are to rest in that. And while we have all learned that we're not gonna rest on our own, we're not gonna be able to get rid of our worry and anxiety. One of the, listen to this. One of the biggest, biggest misconceptions that we see all the time is that vacation will give that to us. Man, South Louisville, Fairdale, uh, Kentucky are full of people that are lake people. And they love to talk about going to the lake. And Don't get me wrong, I like it, it's fun. I've been to the lake, I love jumping off the rocks, I love cliff jumping, I, I like all that stuff. But they, they seem to think or act like going to the lake is gonna create this peaceful life. And so they think, I gotta go more, I gotta go more, I gotta go more. And they're literally people trying to get there all the time. They're people wanting to move there and live there, right? 
But what they know so real is that as soon as they start heading back, what they left didn't get any better. Y'all, that is real life. And you can move from here to there, and you can move from there to there, you can go all the way there, you can go, all the, you can go to the other side of the world. You can find a place in the world that looks like paradise and leave there, and you know what's not going to happen? Peace inside of you. That comes from Jesus. Will you believe him? And in verse 7, he says, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's this awesome thing. Not only does it give peace, but it is a peace that works so well that it's a protector. Now it's guarding my heart. It's guarding my mind. It's protecting me from getting worry, from getting anxious. That's what it does. The relationship with Jesus is so real that it helps with the worry I've got right now, but it protects me from so many others. I used to get stressed out about this. I used to get stressed out about that, but not anymore. Why? I don't know why, except for that the Bible says God's guarding me from that. God's guarding my heart from things that would create anxiety. God is guarding our minds from things that would create anxiety. That's what he says here. I want to end by turning you back to that passage in Matthew 6. It's the passage that Matt read earlier, Matthew chapter 6. And this is the passage where Jesus is speaking about this. If you were looking... If you're looking in the Bible for the two passages on worry and anxiety, now there's, there's, a, there's occasional verse in Psalms, occasional verse in Proverbs, occasional verse in the prophets like Isaiah, but if you were to just Google search even Bible passages on worry and anxiety, it's going to take you to Philippians 4 that we're reading today in Matthew chapter 6, the very words of Jesus. And I've already mentioned it. But look at verse 32, Matthew 6. For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So God knows, and God knows that you need them. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And that's where I had Matt stop. But look at verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Listen to me. God is admitting to us there, life is anxious. Life is worry. There's a lot to worry about. If you have kids, you have a job, if you're living on planet Earth right now in the coronavirus, you, there's a lot to worry about. There is. God knows that. But it doesn't have to debilitate us. It doesn't have to cripple us. It doesn't have to ruin us. God wants us to turn to him and believe. We are to rejoice in the Lord. We are to run to God in prayer. And we are to rest in his peace. Let's pray. Father, thank you. The Bible speaks to things like worry and anxiety. Father, we don't want to be those who make people feel worse. We want to be those who turn to you in prayer. We want to be those who are guarded by you, our Father, you, our Lord. Father, I pray that we would run to you in prayer. I pray that we'd rest in your peace. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work that in us. And Father, if there's anybody now watching this sermon, I pray that you would help with their worry and anxiety that you would give them peace. Father, I pray if there's anybody now watching who thinks this is real to me, that they would contact us. Lord, work in us now for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. assurance Jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine heir of salvation purchase of God born of his spirit washed in his blood this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Perfect delight. from my side.
Let me remind you that we will be having our Wednesday night service the way we've been doing uh, again this week at 7 or normal time. Uh, Remember those um, new things that we're offering this week, the Tuesday night, I think it was, the ladies group, getting together Tuesday night using that same uh, Wednesday night link on the website. And then also Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, Thursday morning Bible study, uh, we'll meet uh, using that same link, uh, the the Wednesday night link from the website as well. and, you know, we hear a lot of people who uh, would love to be able to be involved in some of those Bible studies, Wednesday morning Bible study with men, Thursday morning uh, Bible study with, with women, um, and are not able to because of the time. And so maybe this is a, a time where you're at home now because of different situations. Maybe you're off of work or, um, or whatever it might be. And so we would invite you to um, take part in those opportunities. Uh, Tuesday evening for the ladies. Thursday morning is normally a women's Bible study, but it's open to anyone um, this week, Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. All right, we're going to end our service uh, this morning with um, the words that God gave to Moses, and he told Moses to tell Aaron, um, and this is the way that he was to bless the people of Israel. It says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. Amen.